Thank you, Brother Philip. We all hand the meeting over to Brother Morris. Thank you. A good evening again. It's good to be back um, and finish off the book of Esther. It's been, like I said to Lena earlier, it's been a long journey. And I thank you for your attention and for your interest in the word of God. Will you turn with me to chapter 9 of the book of Esther? Esther chapter 9. The book of Esther and chapter 9. The book of Esther chapter 9 and we'll start reading in verse 1. Esther chapter 9 verse 1. Now in the 12th month, that is the month of Ada, on the 13th day of the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to be put in execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them, though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had ruled over them that hated them. The Jews gathered themselves together in their cities throughout all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus to lay hand on such as sought their herd. And no man could withstand them, for the fear of them fell upon the people. And all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews because of the fear of Mordecai or the, because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame went out throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai waxed greater and greater. Thus the Jews smote all the enemies with a stroke of the sword, and slaughter, and destruction, and did what they would unto those that hated him. Over to chapter 10, please. Chapter 10, verse 1. And the king of Hazarus laid a tribute, that's a tax, on the land and upon the isles of the sea. And all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was great, unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. And we trust the Lord to bless the reading of his precious word. Since this is the last message in the series, let's just take a minute and look at the outline as set out at the start of the series. We've noticed that the book divides into three sections. The Feast of the King, that's chapter 1 and 2. And those feasts were marked by two women and two feasts. In chapters 3 to 8, we have the feasts of the Queen, that's the second section, marked by two men and two feasts. And tonight, we will look at the third and the last section, and that is the feasts of the Jews. And this feast in chapter 9 and 10 will be marked by two letters and two feasts. At the commencement of the book of Esther, banquets and feasts were Persian occasions. But when you come to the close of the book, chapter 9 and 10, Banquets and feasts are entirely Jewish occasions. If the first section of the book primarily focuses on the king and the second section on the queen, this third section focuses primarily on the Jews. And therefore, it is the Jews as a group that comes into focus here. And you will find the expression, the Jews. It doesn't occur in the first section at all because that's all about the king. In the second section, which is about the queen and her people, we're not surprised to find it 21 times. But when you come to the last section of only two chapters, 
and chapter 10 is only three verses. 23 times. References to the Jews, 23 times. So the obvious focus of this last section of Esther, chapter 9 and 10, is the Jews. The Jews. I want you to observe with me the following from these two chapters. In chapter 9, verse 1 to 9, you will have the revenge of the Jews. They were battling, they were fighting the enemies. The revenge of the Jews, verse 1 to 9. And then from verse, um, sorry, to verse 19, verse 1 to 19. From verse 20 to the end of the chapter, verse 20 to 32, you have the remembrance feast of the Jews. So you have the events of the Jews, but verse 20 to 32, you have the remembrance feast of the Jews. And when you come to chapter 10, you have the renowned leader of the Jews. So let's start with chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. We will see the, the events of the Jews. From 1959 until 1994, the Central African country, Rwanda, was plagued racial conflict between two groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis. The Tutsis, a minority group, were hunted down by the Hutus. 85% of the country consists out of Hutus. These two groups, the Tutus and the Hutus, used to live together, they worked together, they socialized together for decades. They were neighbors, they were friends. But when the genocide started in 1994, none of the Tutsis were saved. Not even from their friends and their neighbors. Because in 1994, July 1994, the Hutus turned on the Tutsis and they killed close to a million Tutsi people. Now, the reason why I brought up this piece of history is to help us understand what it must have been like to be a Jew when Haman issued his decree earlier in this book. This decree was sent out through the whole, the entire empire, giving explicit instructions to all the people of the empire to destroy the Jews, to kill the Jews, to annihilate the Jews, and to take their positions. When you come to chapter 9, this day had now arrived. Verse 1, this is D-Day for the Jews. On this day, all the pro haman supporters could claim that the law was on their side. There was a decree that allowed them to kill all the Jews. But then the Jews could also claim the law was on their side because there was a second decree allowing the Jews to defend themselves. So it was indeed a decree or a clash of decrees. And you can imagine it created a lot of tension in the empire of Persia. Now when you come to verse 1, verse 1 highlights for me the tension in the story. But it also highlights the tension in the lives of the Jews. But what I find interesting about verse 1 there is while it highlights the tension, it also at the same time removes the tension. If you look at verse 1, it talks about the fact that the Jews were going to be executed. But looking at the last part, Um, I'll read the whole verse. Now, on the twelfth month, that is the month Ada, on the thirteenth day the same, when the king's commandment and his decree drew near to put into execution, in the day that the enemies of the Jews hoped to have power over them. And listen to this. Though it was turned to the contrary, that the Jews had rule over them that hated them. So, Instead of the enemy having rule over the Jews, the tension is removed, removed right in verse 1. The Jews will have a rule over the enemies. So right there in verse 1, we already know how the story will end. But the author is going to use the next 18 verses. 
to fill in the details. Now, some people, I know some people who love to go to the last page of a book that they read before they actually start reading the book, just to see how the story ends. Because that will help them through the tension-filled parts of the book, knowing that all will be well eventually. So why did the author choose to take out all the drama out of the most climactic scene by telling us how the story will end? I tell you why. It is because the end has never really been in question. The end was never in doubt. If you'd ask Mordecai or, or Esther, how would they be delivered as a group, as a people? I'm sure they would have said, who knows? But somehow, God will deliver his people. My brother and sister, our lives are also full of drama, aren't they? Our lives read like the middle of Esther, where circumstances can change in the blink of an eye. One second we are on top of the world, the next it seems like everything is falling down around us. However, just like in the book of Esther, there's no question about the end. There's no doubt about how our story will end. Because in the end, God always wins. In the end, he will keep his promises. You see, in the middle of Esther's story, God's enemies seem to have it all. And God seems to be absent. In the middle of Esther's story, God's people were suffering. And God seemed to be silent. At the moment, you might find yourself in the middle of your own story. Where God seems silent and God seems absent. If in the middle of our stories, someone asks us how God would keep his promises. I would suggest that the best answer would be, who knows? But no matter what, God always delivers. Now, we don't always understand what God is doing. We don't always know why he let certain things happen in, in the middle of our stories. But the book of Esther reminds us about how the story will end. Even when the path seems rough and uncertain, the end remains unchanged. And so you'll see in Esther's story, Haman goes from being second in command to being impaled on a stake. Mordecai goes from certain death to second in command. God's people go from mourning and fasting and weeping to light and gladness and joy and honor. The lesson is very clear. Never judge things by the way they may appear right now. You see, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews Hope to gain victory over them? The reverse occurred. The Jews gained victory over those who hated them. The day appointed by Haman, and that is the first verse in verse 9. The day that Haman appointed to destroy all of God's people in the empire turned out to be the day not of their destruction, but the day of their deliverance. That's how their story ended. That's how every story in your life will end as well. In verse 2, as a result of Mordecai's and Esther's counter decree, the second decree, the revenge of the Jews were in effect, if in, in effect, self defense. And verse 2 tells us that no one could stand against them, no one could stand against. The Jews, who would have thought? Because God was fighting for them. Now, when you come to verse 2, you'll notice that the Jews gathered themselves. They were well organized. They were ready to meet any attack against them. But the Lord gave them a far greater weapon. Not their swords. Not their organizational skills. Listen to verse 2, the last part of verse 2. 
for the fear of them, that's enemies, for the fear of them, the fear of the Jews fell upon the people. God sent fear into their hearts to keep them from fighting his people. You see, when Israel entered the promised land, we read that the fear of the people, the fear of Israel, paralyzed the nations in Canaan. And that gave Israel the victory. And you'll find in a few other stories of deliverance in the Old Testament, how God used fear on the people to deliver them. Paul highlights the real problem in the world today. In Romans chapter 3, verse 18, Paul says, there's no fear of God before the eyes. Why is our world in such a mess? Why is there such disrespect for God and the things of God and the people of God? There's no fear for God. And so in verse 2, we see that the people gathered themselves in their cities. They gathered, gathered together in the cities. Why? That enabled them to take advantage of their strength of numbers. That's when with two says, and no man could withstand them. That's why every believer should be in fellowship with others. Because none of us, my brother and sister, is strong enough to serve alone. To serve at home. To serve without support. To fight the enemy without the help of others. Can I ask you a question? Are you in fellowship with the Lord's people? Do you enjoy the support of them when things get tough? Are you there to support others when they need you? They gather together themselves in the cities. We find in verse 3, the reason why the Jews prevailed was in verse 2, the people feared them. However, fears, fear was also seen on a much higher level among the leaders and the princes and, and, and the elite of the empire. Verse 3 says, and again at the end of it, the deputies and the officers of the king, they all helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. You see, the fear of the Jews were upon the people. But when it comes to the elite, the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. They recognized and feared the power and the influ influence of Mordecai so much that they assisted the Jews. All because, according to verse 4, because of the influence of Mordecai that simply increased more and more. You see, remember in chapter 6 and in chapter 8, the king extended his scepter, his hand, to accept Esther when she approached him. It wasn't the king, really. We've established God already moved the king's hand in chapter 6 and chapter 8. And now in verse 3, he moves the pagan leaders to protect his people. In the classical music world, the German composer Handel, George Friedrich Handel, he wrote a musical world called, work called The Messiah. And the climax of The Messiah repeats some words over and over again. And these are the words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, over and over again, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If he is the King of Kings, and if he's the Lord over all lords, then he must have the ability to rule over them, to rule through them, no matter whether they acknowledge him or not. These leaders didn't know God. They never acknowledged God. And yet, they assisted God's people because God put the fear of Mordecai upon them. Coming to verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6 describes the actual battle with the foes and how the Jews protected themselves. We read in these few verses that their enemies were totally defeated, especially in verse 6, 
in the city of Sushan. That's where Esther was. That's where Mordecai was. Those whom the, the Jews destroyed in Sushan alone, the, the city of Sushan alone, included 500 people, as well as the 10 sons of Haman. When you come to verse 7 to 9, the author takes the time and the space to name every single one of Haman's 10 sons. Haman had been so proud, extremely proud of his sons. But in the end, not only did he die, but all his sons died with him. Both Haman's decree and Mordecai's decree allowed them to take the spoils. If Haman's people defeated the Jews, they could take the spoils and the possessions and everything that belonged to them. But there was a similar law that was passed to allow the Jews to also take the spoils of their enemies. But something very interesting happened. Look at verse 10. The last part. The end, um, I'll read the whole verse. The ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, slew they, that's the Jews. But on the spoil laid they not their hand. Now this is repeated two more times. In verse 15, in verse 16, they didn't take any of the spoil. Well, our minds go back to chapter 3. When Mordecai was introduced, as a descendant of King Saul. Here we see that Mordecai reversed the legacy of Saul. Because the Jews under Mordecai's leadership, they destroyed the remaining Amalekites. Haman was an Amalekite. His sons were Amalekites. They did what Saul had refused to do. And, and under the leadership of this man, Mordecai, the Jews blotted out the memory of the Amalekites. You will find, when you read the rest of the Bible, there's no mention of the Amalekites after the book of Esther. Secondly, they didn't take the spoil, which they were allowed to do. You remember Saul took the spoil when he wasn't allowed to take it. This is a complete reversal of the wrongs of Saul. Perhaps this was done to show that the Jews didn't act from a desire for wealth or for personal gain. That their motives were not entirely based on self-defense or that their motives were entirely based on self-defense and on protecting themselves. This become very obvious when we remembered that they only killed those who attacked them. You come to verse 6, verse 12, and verse 15, and you notice they only killed the men. Haman decreed that all the Jews had to be killed, whether they attacked them or not. All the, all the women and all the children, they only killed the men. Like I said, they didn't take any of the enemy's positions, although they had a right to do so. So when the, jo the Jews destroy Haman and his sons, they corrected Saul's error. When the Jews left the spoil, they avoided Saul's mistake. Now, if the dispute between Haman and Mordecai is viewed as an extension of that between Agag and Saul. This reversal, in reference to the spoil and the destruction of the Malachites, it completely wiped out the sin of the house of Saul. I find it interesting when you come to verse 12, that the king asked Esther for the third time, or actually the fourth time, what she, what she wanted. Giving the impression that whatever she asked, nothing was off limits. She gave her answer in verse 13. And in verse 13, you will find that she made two requests. Number one, 
that a second day be given to the Jews to fight the enemies in the city of Sushan. Because that's where the battle had been the fiercest. Do you remember that? This was the city of Haman. Haman lived there. His sons lived there. His wife lived there. His friends lived there. And so they put up quite a fight. Out in the provinces, the Jews only needed one day. But in Sushan, they needed more time. And so a first request to the king was that the Jews might be given another day, a second day, to fight the enemies in the city of Sushan. But there was a second request. And that is that the sons of Haman be hanged upon the gallows. Now, this was not torture. These ten sons of Haman were dead already. This was a public display to warn any potential enemies against attacking the Jews. The outcome was a tremendous victory that the Jews had over the enemies. What a reversal of things. In verse 17 to 19, the Jews celebrated with two days of resting and feasting. The battle was over. The fight was over. Now it's time to rest. Now it's time to feast. So there were two days of fighting. Now there will be two days of feasting. Verse 17 shows us that the Jews throughout the empire defended themselves on the first day. They only needed one day and they rested on the second day. Verse 18 shows us that the Jews in Sushan battled the enemies on both the first and the second day for two days before they rested and celebrated. And so the rest of the chapter, verse 19, rather verse 20 to 32, that describes how this led to a two-day annual feast for the Jews. Now I've noticed in the introduction there were two feasts associated with the Jews in chapter 9 and 10. The first feast was a feast of victory to commemorate the defeat of the enemies. Here we see that they had gladness and joy. They, they defeated the enemies. It's come to the end of two days fighting and there was a feast of victory. But there was a second feast. I call it the feast of remembrance. And this feast is described in the rest of the chapter from verse 20 onwards of chapter 9. That brings us to our second point. We've looked at the revenge of the Jews in verse 1 to 19. Now from verse 20 to 32, we see the remembrance feast of the Jews. This is the second feast. By now, the danger had been averted. And following the destruction of the enemy, it was now time to rest. Time to celebrate the victory by feasting and the giving of gifts. I wonder, did they remember the words of David that he wrote 500 years earlier in Psalm 30? He says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Their night was 12 months long. 12 months long. I wonder how long your night is. Maybe a week, a week, months, years. Remember the words of David. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. They've experienced it yet. In the same psalm, David also says, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. These are the things that marked the Jews. They had gladness. They had joy. They were feasting. There are two feasts celebrated by the Jews that was never commanded in the law of Moses. They are Hanukkah and Purim. This section of verse 20 to 32 explains the institution of the second feast, Purim. Not only is this the third section of Esther, marked by two, two feasts, but I want you to note 
It's also marked by two letters, as we'll see in a minute. In verses 20 to 21, you see, in the beginning, the Jews were united in their victory. But they were divided in their celebration. They celebrated on different days. Remember the, remember the Jews in the, in the regions, in the country, they only had one day of fighting and they celebrated the next day. But those who lived in the city, in Sushan, they had to fight for two days before they could celebrate. So they were united in their victory, but they were divided in their celebration. They celebrated on different days, dependent on where they lived, in the city or in the country. This gave birth to the first letter written by Mordecai, in which he instructed all the Jews everywhere to celebrate this feast Purim together as a nation. And, and to do that yearly as a feast of remembrance of the deliverance from Haman. In verse 24, verse 24 reminds us of where it all started. It started with this very man, Haman. Haman, the enemy of the Jews, decreed a law by which all the Jews in the empire were to be destroyed. Haman is mentioned 43 times in Scripture. All of them in the book of Esther. But this, verse 24, this is the very last mention of Haman's name. He's already gone out. He's dead. But now his name is mentioned also for the last time. And when it is mentioned for the last time, it is defined in, a, he is defined in a number of ways. Number one, verse 24 says that Haman was the Agagite. That means that he belonged to a doomed race. Secondly, he is the enemy of all the Jews. Not only of Mordecai, the enemy of all the Jews. He desired to destroy them all, but he himself was destroyed in the end. A third thing that's said about him in verse 24 is that he had cast her. That is the lot. You remember that earlier on in the book. But his action of casting Pur became the very reason for the feast. And even the very name for the annual feast of the Jews, Purim, was named after the fact that Haman cast Pur, Purim. So Haman was defined by his humiliating end and not his glorious beginning. My brother and sister, I wonder how your life will be defined. You see, as a believer, we all had a glorious beginning. But what about the end? What will you be facing at the judgment seat of Christ? What will define you then? Your rewards or your losses? It will affect your service for eternity. Verse 27 to 28, as we come to the close of the chapter. These two verses highlight the annual remembrance of this feast to ensure that these events would never be forgotten. You'd say, how could they be forgotten? Or oh, we are prone to forget. That's just the problem Every man has. Every woman has. But during this feast, they would read the entire book of Esther. Verse 27 and 28 makes it clear it had to be remembered every year. And when the feast was celebrated, the book, the entire book of Esther would be read out aloud. And when the book was read out aloud, the children will shout loudly to drown out the name of Haman. But they will cheer when Mordecai's name was being read. Why did they have to do it every year? Well, this feast would remind them 
that the God of heaven was able to take their darkest days and use them for good. They've experienced it. It will remind them that the God of heaven was able to take the very day of their destruction to bring them the great deliverance from the enemies. To turn their sorrow into joy. To bring their story to a satisfactory end. You see on the eve of the crucifixion. The disciples forgot. All about Purim. They have celebrated Purim. Every single year. On the eve of the crucifixion. They forgot about the story. Of Esther. They forgot how the story ended. They forgot that their God was in control and they judged their God by their present circumstances. No wonder when you come to John chapter 14, their hearts were filled with sorrow. Further on after the crucifixion, their minds were filled with fear and they locked themselves behind closed doors. Both the Jews and his disciples Failed to understand what God was doing when he sent his son into the world. Christ came to rescue his people, but he was put on trial. He was sentenced to death. He hung upon the cross. In that moment, the sun refused to sign. The world was covered in darkness. In that moment, there was a great earthquake that opened many graves. At that moment, the unbreakable veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. God knew that it would look like he had abandoned his only son. That he was failing to keep his promises. It would look like the enemies had gained victory over Christ. The Jews and the disciples thought the story was over. But they'd forgotten Purim. Which was a reminder that God will always triumph at the end of the story. But on that dark day at Calvary, there was one who didn't forget Purim. He never lost sight of how the story ended. He was forsaken in the middle of his story. Heaven was silent in the middle of his story. He suffered exceedingly in the middle of his story, but he refused to judge his God based on his present circumstances. God put his stamp of approval on his life and on his work by raising him up from among the dead, giving him a place at his right hand and a name above every name. My brother and sister, it's important for us to remember that. But since we are prone to forget, the Lord himself instituted a feast of remembrance. Just like Mordecai and Esther. A feast of remembrance so that we will not forget what happened 2,000 years ago. You see, the Jews never forget to remember Purim annually. Wherever a Jew finds himself in the world, when it comes to March, that's our time, our calendar, they will go somewhere to celebrate Purim. But we have a better feast. We celebrate an even better victory. Not once a year, but once a week. Are you there? Are you there every week? Or are you among those who miss this feast for no particular reason? I'm reminded of the words of the Hebrew writer in chapter 10, verse 25, when he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner or the habit of some is. Why is it so important to be there why is it so important to remember the Lord's Supper? To be at the Lord's Supper, to remember the Lord. Because it will remind you about how the story ends. It's there that we remember that He is alive. 
It is there that we remember that he will come again, that the story ended well. Now the Jews responded well to this, these letters. And they celebrated this feast without fail since then. No matter where they are in the world. But you come, when you find, look at the, the, the Lord's Supper, the feast that the Lord instituted. You find that the early church also responded very well to the Lord's desire and his command to remember him. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, Paul and his, and his, and his crew, as it were, although they were in a hurry, Paul changed his travel plans. And he waited a whole week to break bread with the saints at Troas in his desire to remember the Lord. Oh, what about us? What do we do when we are away on business trips? What about our holidays? Do we make a special effort to find the Lord's people and celebrate the Lord's Supper with him? That is his desire and his command for us every week until he returns. Two letters mark the section. We've looked at the first letter. When you come to verse 29 to 31, both Esther and Mordecai wrote and confirmed the feast of Purim with a second letter. A second letter. Esther wrote a second letter in addition to the one already written by Mordecai to confirm the importance of the feast of Purim. It is verse 32 that confirms for me that this was the brainchild of Esther. It says, and the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim. Now it asks the question, why a second letter to confirm the same thing? Wasn't the waste of time? Well, it shows the importance of this feast. In verse 20, Mordecai wrote the first letter as a representative of the Jews. And the authority of one who is seen as a leader of the Jews. And now in verse 29, Esther confirms this feast with the royal authority of queen of the Persian Empire. So the first letter was written by a representative of the Jews and the second by a rep representative of the Persian Empire. Now this feast may not have been instituted by Moses for the land, but it was established by the highest Jewish authorities outside the land at the time, a Jewish prime minister, Mordecai, and the Jewish queen of Persia, Esther. Now, I've met quite a number of Jews over the last 10 years or so. And some of them were religious Jews, and some of them were secular Jews. And they don't celebrate the feasts. Now, although many of the Old Testament feasts are not celebrated by all secular Jews today, the only one celebrated by all the Jews, whether religious or secular, is this feast, the Feast of Purim. This day was to be remembered, but not for the reason that Haman had thought. The Lord's Supper, likewise, is to be remembered, but not for the reasons his enemies have thought. Both Purim and the Lord's Supper remind us of a triumphant victory and the glorious exaltation. And that leads us right into chapter 10, where we see the renowned leader of the Jews. The renowned leader of the Jews. Haman, Mordecai's predecessor, used this office to serve himself only. And he used this office to destroy the Jews. 
Mordecai, on the other hand, he used the same office to serve the king and to help the Jews. You see, sometimes when people enjoy promotions and they get to the top of the ladder, they forget their roots and they ignore the needs of the common people. Not Mordecai. Not Mordecai. Even though in verse 2, we read that Mordecai's political deeds were recorded in the history books of the empire. You will find what he did for his people had been recorded by God in heaven. Mordecai was held in high esteem as prime minister over all of Persia. That means the Jews had a friend in the highest place. The highest place. The renowned leader. Although chapter 10 describes the greatness of both the king and Mordecai, the focus in this small, um, short chapter seems to be on the second in command. That once despised and condemned man, Mordecai the Jew. So when you come to verse 1 of chapter 10, you'll discover that the king imposed a tribute, a tax, on the land and all the islands of the sea. It seems his empire expanded. This appears to be a statement of his power and his authority, but it also reflected a stable empire, a sound empire. But why did the author mention the new tax program of the king what does it have to do with Mordecai? Well, Mordecai seems to be the one who engineered this new tax system as a source of wealth and income for the king and for the kingdom, being the king's right-hand man and his closest trusted counselor. Now, there'd be no need for the king to give in to bribery as seen back in chapter 3 when Haman was able to bribe him with money. The last verse of chapter 10 and of the book. The story ends by presenting Mordecai as a powerful man, second only to the king. What a tremendous turnaround of events. Just 12 months earlier, the Jews had a foe in the highest place, Haman, fighting against them, working against them. Seeking to destroy them. And now they have a friend in the highest place. Fighting for them. Interceding for them. Working on their behalf. Both Esther and Mordecai work together to bring deliverance to the Jews. While Esther intervened courageously on a couple of occasions or a few occasions, you'll see that Mordecai was an ongoing intermediary for the Jews. They had a friend in the highest place. Like Joseph of old, Mordecai ministered peace and wealth and welfare, not only to his people, but also to a complex international setting. Joseph was in the pagan land. Mordecai finds himself in the pagan land. He was a model Israelite who brought the blessing of Abram to foreign nations, to Gentiles. I'm not surprised that he is the first person in the Bible to be called a Jew, Mordecai the Jew. But this is the real climax of the book. Because prophetically, it presents Christ in all his sufferings, and in all his glory. You see, Mordecai was a Benjaminite. The son of Kish. Christ was the true Benjaminite. The man of sorrows. The son of God's right hand. But here we find a Benjaminite. In exile. Some years ago, the Persian king Cyrus allowed all the Jews to go back to Judah, to go back to their place, to Jerusalem. Mordecai is still here. It is almost unbelievable 
that the Benjaminite like Mordecai should fail to return to Jerusalem when given the chance. But the heavenly Mordecai came from heaven to Jerusalem where he was rejected and where he was crucified outside the city gates. Mordecai was a great savior of the Jews, but he is the savior of the world. Mordecai became the, the prime minister of Persia, but his rule is universal, eternal, and supremely glorious. More than just a prime minister, our Lord is the Prince of Peace. He's a prince and a savior. Revelation 1 says, He's the prince of the kings of the earth. And Revelation 19 says, He's the king of kings and He's the Lord of lords. As we close, In this story, we are introduced to the world in chapter 1. We see the king and his parties and his palaces and all those kind of things. We are introduced to the world and all their positions and all the wicked ways of the world. But brother and sister, don't let the prosperity, prosperity of the wicked or the suffering of God's people discourage you. It does, you know. In this entire book, God isn't mentioned once. He seems silent. He seems absent. Yet in the face of overwhelming odds, the story ends with God rescuing his people and crushing his enemies. Now, you don't have to see God. And you don't have to understand his ways to know how your story will end. The invisible hand of God is seen everywhere, in every event, in every reversal. And with hindsight, I'm sure you'll be seeing, you'll, be, you'll see God's invisible hand in your life, in your stories. You see, these were no coincidences. They were too many. This was not random. There was a power behind it. There was a plan behind it all. We go through life trying to fix all of life's little puzzles and perplexities. But you know, we can actually rest in God. And we can actually rest on God. And we should accept in faith. That our God is over us and he's under us and he's above us. He's below us. He's around us. Ordering every little detail of our lives. Do you know the chorus? God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own. So next time you face circumstances and difficulties. I want you to take your, your eyes off the middle of your story. And I want you to remember how the story ends. How do we know that our story will end well as, as well? How do we know that we will have the similar ending than Esther and the Jews of, of those times? Philippians chapter 1 and 6. Paul writes to them, he says, Being confident in this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you, there's a beginning to your story, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, my brother and sister, life is not easy. And life is full of stories. And all those stories together makes up the story, it's make up the story of your life. Difficulties and circumstances and opposition and persecution, you name it. Sickness and, and, and you name it. But God has begun a good work in you. The story had begun and he will end it in a satisfactory way. It will be performed until the day of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word. Shall we pray? Father, we encouraged by the amazing story
of Easter. We are thankful that we worship the same God who rules the heavens and the earth. And we know that all things are being worked together by thy power for our good and for thy eternal glory. We know that we don't live in the world of random events, but that every step is ordered by the Lord himself. How wonderful to know that despite the circumstances of life and despite the storms of life, we are being led upwards to a better place, to heaven, to glory. Bless us, we pray, in the precious name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, thank you, Brother Marius, for sharing with us. And as we mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we want to thank you for your uh, many messages of uh, encouragement and has been uh, for the upbuilding of the saints. Now, the meeting's over. You're welcome to unmute your mic if you want to share your thanks with uh, Brother Marius. You're welcome to do so now. But the meeting's over, and thank you, everyone, for joining. <clears throat> thanks, Marius. And on my part, thank you for your, again, for your time, for your attention and for your interest in the word of God. May the Lord bless you as a result. Have a good evening. Night. Well, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, next week, we'll have a brother from uh, Australia who will share with us. Brother Willems Alcana, and uh, pray for that meeting, and we'll be happy to send everyone a um, thank you, everybody, for joining. God bless. We'll end the meeting right now.